and we'll give several examples of this important uh, area, which is sometimes called the Internet of Things. Clouds are particularly good for sensors, as we've mentioned before, because sensors are small. And so, at least they typically are small. You could call a giant satellite a sensor, I guess, but uh, most sensors are small. And so, those sensors can be uh, processed by individual cores on the cloud. And in fact, a given core on the cloud can probably do multiple small sensors. We used to measure numbers like a thousand sensors being processed by a single a single core. And then we got, of course, parallelism because we have lots of sensors. So this is a natural cloud application, which you see every day when you use your smartphone. Here's our usual collections, and there we will be doing sensor informatics. First, let's discuss the Internet of Things, which is really what I mean by sensors. So there is some there is an estimate I point out many times. You can get lots of different estimates from different websites on the uh, available. So but one estimate is 24 billion devices on the internet by 2020. And most of these will be small sensors sending streams of information sporadically into the cloud. As noted, possibly the most obvious sensor is a smartphone, which in fact has multiple small sensors, like like the webcam, it, like the camera it has, or the um, accelerate accelerometer it has, the GPS it has. Those are little sensors, or even just the, the typing. As you type in, you effectively act, you're effectively a sensor. And these uh, different sensors. Um, stream data, these sensors can also just be monitors of around your electrical devices or monitoring your home or your children and things like that. And these sensor streams are processed into knowledge and they will help us our lives in a multitude of fashion. And it, it is relatively clear the cloud is very, very good at controlling sensors. And it does two things, it can control the sensor and it also gives the sensor, in the case of the smartphone, access to the world's knowledge. So that's why you can do browsing on your smartphone and do email on your smartphone. It's because you're connected by the cloud to the rest of the world. And there are various sort of um, other terms which effectively imply this. And they usually have the word uh, like smart, the smart homes and grids is a common term. Intelligent River is a project at Clemson. Ubiquitous City is a project particularly in Korea. And we expect this uh, idea of building smartness into everything, whether it be people or vehicles or what have you, will be of growing importance. And all of these are likely to be supported in the cloud, and a particular example, which we'll see with, say, um, the autonomous uh, car is robotics, where robots will get their intelligence from the cloud. And some of these will support science, some of these will support people, and all of them have this natural parallelism of the things. So this is the classic pleasingly parallel application, where the pleasing, this is 24 billion. That's the number of these, this estimate of the number of devices. Also, these uh, things are naturally distributed, so these 24 billion devices are not all in one place. They're around the world. So we need the inter internet to actually connect all our smart things to the clouds and let's connect the clouds together and give, give our little um, devices access to other devices and to other forms of information. So, Here's a sort of slightly more formal discussion. So a sensor is essentially any sink or source of um, a time series. Uh, so smartphones obviously stream data as a function of time. Kindles do, tablets, connects, webcams, these are all sensors. Robots and distributed instruments such as environmental measuring devices are sensors. Um, you can. Uh, Google Docs, Office 365, WebEx, web pages, these are all sensors by that definition. And ubiquitous cities and smart homes are full of sensors. 
And as I mentioned, sensors being distributed are grids. And in fact, um, a simple example of a sensor is a web page. It's sort of a broken sensor because it always gives the same answer. So it has a very, very modest time dependence. And as I mentioned, we use clouds to consolidate and control and collaborate with sensors. And they all have this pleasingly parallel implementation because sensors are small. They don't load the um, their interface in the cloud so much that you need multiple cores. You do need multiple cores when the sensor does a web search, but we've already discussed that. The sensor needs multiple cores when it does a web search, but it doesn't use web search very often. And so it's quite efficient to have lots of cores doing web search, and those are shared in short time intervals for each of the different sensors. Okay, so the Large Hadron Collider is one of these giant sensors I mentioned. It's uh, all in one place, and uh, as soon as it uh, records the data, it is all sprinkled around the world. Uh, and so it does actually end up looking like still pretty big sensors, but more than just one. So your 15 petabytes of data from the Large Hadron Collider is, ends up very quickly spread around the world. Here's an example of sort of just summarizing sensors as a service. We have all our devices. These are the sensors we use in our collaboration with Kansas to measure data. Here are things like uh, Microsoft Connect, smartphones, Lego robots, webcams. They're all linked to the cloud where they see sensor processing as a service, which could be map produced to link multiple sensors together. And we have a little project developing open sensor software. Here's an example I gave earlier from General Electric. This is from this nice talk at Berkeley in November, um, but 2012, where it points out that uh, the amount of Twitter data every day is much less than the amount of data that General Electric gets from their engines. Their engines are full of monitoring or health health sensors, which are looking at the what goes on in their engines, transmitting that back to the GE cloud. And that allows us to have to do much safer transportation. So these are exciting type of sensor, which I expect to see growing use as we do more and more digital, digital uh, IT enabled um, um, industrial devices. So this is some more data on this about. Uh, the value of the data that this gives from 25,000 engines, 3.6 million flight records a month. And this allows you to derive 18 million parameters every month. And it gives you fuel efficiency, gives you better capacity, gives you more reliability. Here's an example from the same um, meeting in Berkeley where IBM discusses the, one of the systems they set in to, to do a vehicle monitoring. So this is an important area with lots of applications. Other people do this, where you monitor tra traffic, you monitor, you can actually monitor the, you know, how busy it is at any given point. You monitor the uh, position and health of various vehicles, and you put all that together to run to produce a better transportation system. It's relatively clear that this will produce significant improvement. I mean, one trivial thing is, is that by if you really monitor all your buses, you can make certain they keep to time. And instead of getting five buses in five minutes and then no buses for an hour, those buses really are spread out over time. Here's a Google Car. And we see this is a full of sensors, cameras. Those sensors are either make local decisions or they go off to the cloud. And this is an important issue with, um, with uh, cloud support of ro robots. Some robots, if you have to make your decision very quickly, you can't afford to go to the cloud. If you can wait seconds for your decision, then you go off to the cloud. So. You need to look carefully at your computations and do those that are needed immediately and uh, locally, and those that can uh, need more data, 
and hopefully can tolerate a somewhat longer delay, they go off to the cloud. Here's other similar examples, drones. These are of course self-propelled vehicles that go off, they're used for uh, uh, disaster relief, they uh, are used to monitor sports events, they're used to check for problems with agriculture, crop, crop, crop damage, and things like that. Lots of important uses of these unmanned vehicles, unpersoned vehicles, I should say. Here we have uh, sc scanning, it, uh, which is, of course, um, can be used for lots of different things. It can be used for your uh, ticket when you board your aircraft. We now know, of course, you can download your your boarding pass to your smartphone. You can uh, look up, uh, you can scan the tag on every every um, thing in a supermarket and immediately find out how healthy it is, what its price is, and there are a lot of related applications with RFID for monitoring the logistics of merchandise. So these are all exciting one and up. UPS and FedEx and those companies use this continuously when they're delivering packages. Here's a collection of sensors I've been involved with, the hexacopter, the Need some Lego thing, Lego things here. GPS. Here's a little small device. Uh, here's the RFID reader and tag, webcam, a laptop running PowerPoint is uh, with, with WebEx or equivalent is of course a sensor, and the Microsoft Connect is a very high high volume sensor giving a lot of data. Here's an example we did with NASA some time ago using a, a cloud to to host the results of GPS sensors, and that's where we measured the performance because these GPS data sensors only give uh, very rather low data rates. You can put thousands of them, of the sensors on a, on a single node. And this produces sensor data which can be analyzed in this case to give indi early indications of earthquakes. <coughs> 